over there. We've got something that has a name. We have a theorem that has a name. Our first one is called the squeeze theorem. Okay, it's called the squeeze theorem. Now, to be completely honest, um, pretty much the only time I've seen the squeeze theorem as a question on the AP exam is uh, it was kind of, y'all would call it a trick question, okay, because it tries to make you think that you use the squeeze theorem. Okay, but here's the thing about theorems. They have. Everything has to be exactly how it's worded in the theorem in order to use it. Okay, so I'm going to kind of walk through this and I'm going to explain to you um, how it can be manipulated to make you think that that's what it is, but you can't really use that. Alright, so what we've got going on here is we've got three functions, h of x, f of x, and g of x. Uh, what this inequality notation right here means, it means that the y values for h are always less than the y values for f, which are always less than the y values for g, or equal to. They could be equal to at some point, but um, so h is your function on the bottom, f is somewhere in the middle, and g is the function on top. Um, then they tell us that the limit as we approach some c value of h of x and g of x, the two functions on the ends, are the same value. Okay? The limit as we approach an x value for the two functions on the ends are the same. If we know that, then we can say that uh, the limit as x approaches c of the middle function exists and it is the same limit. Okay? It exists and it is the same limit. Uh, so let's look at an example of this right here. Okay? Um, I've given you three functions and um, I'm going to graph them. Okay? I've got the negative absolute value of x plus 4. Okay? So if I'm graphing that then I go up to positive 4, and it's the negative absolute value, so it's downward facing. Alright, so that's what this looks like. Oop. Okay, and these are named on purpose. So I'm going to do h of x and g of x, and then uh, I'll talk about the other one. g of x is x squared plus 4, so it also has a vertex at positive 4, but it's a quadratic, so it is headed up looking like this. Okay, so there's our h of x and our g of x. So you can see h of x is always less than our g of x function. Now let's uh, see where f of x falls in there. We've got x over 2 plus 4. Well, that's a linear function. It doesn't really look like it, but that's the same as 1 half x plus 4. So it has the same y-intercept. Slope of 1 half means up 1 over 2. So that's what f of x looks like, roughly. Okay? So f of x is between these two functions right here. Always. What is the limit as we approach zero of f of x? Well, clearly we can look at it and say, well, as we approach zero, f of x is approaching four. Okay? Um, but we could also use the squeeze theorem to use this or uh, to, to show that fact, okay? Because the limit as x approaches zero of h of x is four, and the limit as x approaches zero of g of x is four. Then because they're the same thing and f of x is between them at all times, then the limit of f of x must also be 4. Okay? It seems like, well, why on earth does this exist? Honestly, I don't really know, but they like to test to make sure that you know your theorems. Okay? Um, now, how I have seen this phrase before is they've set it up like this. Okay? H of x is less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to g of x. But then, Instead of the two limits being the same for the output two functions, uh, they say, for 
example, the limit of h of x is 1, and the limit of g of x is 2. And one of your answer choices is, well, then the limit of f of x must be between 1 and 2. So they said that maybe it looks like the squeeze theorem, and they got you thinking about that, but that's not what the squeeze theorem says. Okay? The only time the squeeze theorem that applies is if both these limits are the exact same value, then you can say the one in the middle has the exact same limit. Okay? Um, but what I just described, they do not have the exact same limit, so you can't just say that the limit has to be between two values. It's only talking about it equaling a specific value. All right, now we are actually going to kind of prove something here. Uh, this limit, we've talked about it a couple of times. The limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x, does anybody remember what that value is supposed to be? 1. Okay, very good. It is supposed to be 1. Okay, but let's use the fact that the sine of theta over theta, okay, theta is we're just changing the variable, it's the same function, it's just a different variable. Its value is always between cosine of theta and 1. Okay? It's sandwiched, it's squeezed by those two functions there. So we're going to talk about um, why can we use that fact to show that that limit is 1. So the limit as x approaches 0 of the cosine of theta, well, what is the cosine of 0? Cosine of 0 is equal to 1. Okay, the limit as x approaches 0 of 1, okay, our other function, what's that limit? 1. Okay, so we've got this set up for the squeeze theorem. Sine of theta over theta is between cosine of theta and 1. We've established that the limits of the two end functions are the same thing. So by the squeeze theorem, that limit is equal to 1. Okay, that is one way that you can use the squeeze theorem. Now, you must have this memorized. Okay, you must have this memorized. And that's actually the next little thing we've got there on our paper. We have two special trig limits. This is one of them. The other one involves cosine. Alright, so our two special trig limits that we must know are that the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x is 1. Okay, notice it only applies when we're approaching 0. I mentioned this yesterday. If we're approaching anything else, say pi over 2, then you plug in pi over 2. Okay, pi over 2 is not going to create an issue for us. This, what is the sine of pi over 2? 1. So 1 over pi over 2 is equal to 2 over pi. Okay? They, I know it's mean, but they will try and get you with that. They will. They know that you're supposed to learn these two special trig limits, and then they will ask you a question where it's not approaching 0, it's approaching some other value, but guess what's an answer choice? 1 is an answer choice. Okay? When you flip the bottom over, when you flip pi over 2 over, you got to, yeah, okay. Um, the other one, the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine of x over x is 0, okay? That limit is 0. You just got to have those memorized, be able to do them without a calculator. Do what? No, you do not have to know why it equals 0. You do not. Oh, why does it equal zero? Let's see if I can explain it. Mm. Okay, so we can't plug in zero, okay? We obviously can't plug in zero because we get zero over zero. So let's think about the idea of a limit. You're getting really, really, really close to that x value, okay? You're not actually technically equal to that x value. You're getting really, really close to it. So let's think about a number that's really, really, close to zero. Alright, for example, 0 0.001. Okay, 0 0.001. Now, I don't know exactly what the value of 
the cosine of 0 0.001 is. But if I think about my cosine function, okay, think about cosine for a second. Um, cosine looks like this, right? So as I'm getting closer and closer to zero, I'm getting closer and closer to one. So I've got one minus a number that is super, super close to one. And then let's think about my denominator. Um, I said that the value was like 0 0.001. So we've got 1 minus a number that's really close to 1. Divided by 0 0.001. Okay, so let's think about this. We've got, this is essentially 0. And we're dividing 0 by really, really, really tiny number. Okay, so we've got 0 Second, uh, any time tangent comes into play, typically we always turn things into terms of sine and cosine, right? We try and change things to terms of sine and cosine so that we can deal with that because we know more about sine and cosine than we do about tangent. So I'm going to replace tangent with sine of x over, not tangent of x, sine of x over cosine of x. That's what happens when you talk and write at the same time. Okay. Um, so it looks like I made my problem a little bit more complicated because now I've introduced a complex fraction, but that's okay because it's getting us to where we want to go. So complex fraction, we always keep the top the same. We flip the bottom over. Well, the bottom wasn't a fraction. We can make it a fraction by putting it over 1. So when we flip it over, it's 1 over x. Now this is interesting. Something's looking a little familiar here. Sine of x and x. Here's the nice thing about algebra. When you're multiplying, you can kind of rearrange things however it's convenient for you. Now, you can't move things from the numerator to the denominator, but you can exchange denominators because the order of, uh, the order of multiplication doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether I'm multiplying sine of x over cosine times 1 over x or Now let's think back to our properties. Our properties said that if we're multiplying two functions and we know their limits, we can just multiply their limits. So what's the limit as x approaches 0 of the sine of x over x? It is 1. Now I'm going to break this up like this just for the sake of making things a little bit more clear. Okay. That limit is 1, and the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over cosine, I don't know that right off the top of my head, but I can substitute, and the cosine of 0, what did we say that was a second ago? 1, so we've got 1 times 1 over 1. This limit is also 1. The limit as x approaches 0 of the tangent of x over x is 1. Now, do you have to memorize that? probably wouldn't hurt because you don't want to have to go through this manipulation if they ever ask you that question. Um, but I haven't seen that one. Okay, I really haven't seen that as a question. Uh, but the, the main point of this is that 